Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Again, I'm Harvey Miller from Ohio State and chair of the Mapping Science Committee, and I'm pleased to uh, be moderating this third session on smart communities. I'll first introduce our keynote speaker, Michael Barabay, and then I'll, after the keynote, I'll introduce our panelists. Um, Michael Barabay is the Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary for Transportation in the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. In this role, he oversees the office's sustainable transportation sector, which includes vehicle, fuel cell, bioenergy bio technologies offices. This portfolio focuses on the research and development to increase access to domestic clean transportation fuels and improve the energy efficiency, convenience, and affordability of transporting people and goods to support U.S. energy security, economic productivity, and competitiveness. He brings more than 25 years' experience in the automotive industry to his new post, specifically in the areas of environmental compliance, energy and safety policy, and product development and marketing. Michael has a BS in civil engineering from MIT, an MS degree in the technology and policy program, and a master's degree from the Sloan School of Management. Michael, please. Do you want me to use microphones in here? Yeah, yeah. All right. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, for inviting me to speak here. Um, I'm going to take uh, maybe about uh, 20 minutes. We can make sure we have lots of time later for, for Q&A. Um, want to do a few things. First, um, give you a little bit of a feel of what, what we do at DOE in the transportation area, what we mean by sustainable transportation, kind of how we view it, how we're coming at it. And then given the, the, the topic of the two committees here today, I chose uh, three specific examples uh, we could I, would love to talk all day. I love uh, the work of transportation, but I chose three specific examples that I think are all have a, uh, a, a significant geospatial mapping related question at its core that are going to be critically important to transportation. Thank you. I was wondering how I was going to do that. All right, so let me give you a little bit of sense of uh, just background, the transportation sector at DOE. So we are at uh, the Department of Energy, largely an R&D uh, funding organization in transportation. Our uh, budget is approximately $700 million per year historically, uh, of course, subject to appropriations covering across transportation. For those of you that don't know, um, the national labs of the country, there are 17 national labs of the country, Argonne, Los Alamos, NREL, uh, et cetera, those are all part of the Department of Energy. So much of our work uh, is done through, the, through those national labs, with those national labs, but uh, by no means all of it. About half our work is done with uh, academic institutions and the private sector as well. And of course, you know, one of the great things about being at DOE is that we have literally I think the most amazing scientific resources available to us uh, in the area of computing especially but also in the physical sciences uh, as well. So within my area we have um, three core focuses. Um, the vehicle tech and these are four separate offices. Uh, the first kind of cross-cutting vehicle technologies office uh, is basically charged with developing new technologies to significantly improve the energy efficiency and the affordability uh, simultaneously and also maintain or improve air quality if possible across all different types of uh, all different types of vehicles. So they do a significant amount of work uh, in batteries. They're best known literally the Vehicle Technologies Office are the ones who are inventing the batteries that are in your phones, in your computers, and in electric cars. Uh, two of the three recent Nobel uh, laureates for uh, lithium-ion battery are actually uh, active researchers uh, still on our program, uh, and we've been funding them uh, pretty much since the beginning. Uh, we also work extensively on engines and uh, energy efficiency of engines, all different types of uh, all different types of fuels, uh, and a lot of work on mobility overall, mobility as a system, and looking at the system level impact. I want to talk about that a little bit more. Hydrogen and fuel cells is a significant program area as well for us, looking at not just fuel cell vehicles, but also hydrogen more broadly and the hydrogen economy and how hydrogen can play a critical role uh, in the overall economy as an energy carrier uh, beyond uh, just uh, mobility and, and vehicles. And then last, bioenergy uh, technology. We have, again, another office that while its core mission is to develop affordable low carbon biofuels. Um, a lot of, to do that, you have to create um, a lot of other things on the way, a lot of products and the ability to make uh, chemicals and other products from biological uh, pathways and routes is uh, core to what they are doing. So 
take a step back. When I, we think about transportation, transportation, uh, I'm a civil engineer. I started in transportation, so I'm a little biased, but uh, it is fundamental uh, to our way of life when you think about it. Our economy and our lives fundamentally rely on transportation. How how far could you get the food you eat or how far could you work if you didn't have transportation? Um, transportation today in the economy, 3 tw trillion vehicle miles, 11 billion tons of freight every year just in the United States. And of course, uh, we are just one part of a global transportation system. But when we look at transportation, it is changing rapidly, right? When you look at uh, not just the technology, but you look at um, the human factor side of it today, right? First of all, transportation is the second highest expense in a typical American household. One fifth of the average American household, that's average. If you're in the lower in uh, half the income bracket, it can be 30%. So you think about it, and that's after housing itself. So transportation is a significant economic cost for people. Um, you look at businesses as well. You look at aging uh, and the population is aging. One third of people 65 and older, which is one of our largest growing demographic segments, have some level of mobility related impairment. You look at population growth, right? We're going to add 70 million people over the next 30 years at projected growth rates. Those will largely be in 11 different mega regions across the country, causing again more people, more growing economy, hopefully. Um, you're going to need transportation to move people and goods from uh, point A to B. And when we think about transportation, while much of it historically has been focused on core ground transportation, vehicles, cars, and trucks. Um, we look much more broadly. We certainly uh, spend a lot of our time, our money, our effort in cars and trucks. But you think about um, micro-mobility choices. This chart's just amazing to me. This goes through 2018. Um, the yellow bar at the end is the uh, scooter share. And, you know, those of you that are from the D.C. area can relate to, you know, when, when uh, stationary bikes and dockless bikes, yeah, this dockless bike, this must be the thing. And then how quickly, and, and I, I like this chart because it very much matches my sense of how um, disruptive changes happen, right? It, you don't know it's disruptive until it's disruptive something, until it's here and upon you. And it's often not the first thing in an area that is changing that is the disruptor. It's often the second or third thing, as you can see with scooters. That's 2018. If you look at the 2019 bar, I, I will hazard a guess will easily, easily be double that, if not more. Um, so it, it shows an example of how quick things can change. Of course, package delivery, uh, I don't know if, which house here you can relate to the most uh, with the holidays coming up. Uh, uh, we'll see more of that. The growth rate, this is just U.S. Postal Service data, which is pretty... Um, pretty related to the overall, they're the largest uh, deliverer of goods still, but 50% increase over the last four years in package delivery. And of course, uh, Ubers and Lyfts and um, transportation options have been changing dramatically when you look at the, uh, the trends. Now, you, so you look at that, this is um, in billions, billions of annual ridership. Although if you put this graph against all rides, these bars would be really tiny because we're in trillions, right, of rides overall. But yet, um, it's a significant change in how people, how people uh, access transportation and also how we study and think about it, right? Because if you purely use a historic measure of rides, you would say, well, this is pretty small. It's, it's uh, not very relevant. But yet, yeah, it's obviously very disruptive and changing how people access transportation because of the second and third order effects uh, it can have. So um, th that's a core thought we have. So when we look across all of, um, all of transportation and the work we are trying to do fundamentally again, trying to drive towards how do we get a more sustainable and affordable system, it's across this backdrop of this tremendous change in technology that's happening. Um, I'm often a believer though that uh, tech, oftentimes we talk about technology driving change. I believe that oftentimes technology is not the core driver. Technology, I like to think of as oftentimes more the enabler. There's underlying economics, there's underlying unmet needs, there's something else that's going on, and then technology is there at the right time, at the right place to help, uh, help enable it. But technology alone isn't necessarily the driver. We looked across this whole space and uh, having energy efficiency as our core mandate. About three years ago, we did a study looking at the energy impacts. And this is a bounding study, so it, it only has so much usefulness, but uh, it is worthwhile noting. We looked at it and looked at what are all the changes, both on the positive and negative side, that these mobility changes could have on energy, what are all the impacts they could have, and showed that there could be up to a 200% increase in energy consumption or a 60% decrease. And you think about, as we looked at that, and this is before we had any work going on on automation, connectivity, mobility, micromobility at DOE, and we basically made the case uh, that we need to be studying this very, very well because all of the other work we're doing 
could be completely dwarfed. We could invest a ton of money in a specific technology area and have it wiped out by increased induced demand. Now, we're also very clear to say our, our goal is not to say we want to decrease mobility. In fact, we've had to come up with new measures. So how to, you know, increased mobility is generally a good thing, but how do you understand the impacts of increased mobility and how do you do it in a way, ultimately, we like to think of, could we ultimately decouple mobility and energy consumption? So you can have growing mobility without an increased use uh, in, in overall energy. So I want to, with that kind of maybe as a little bit of a background on how we think about our mobility work, um, and I, I kind of mentioned the three different office areas we have or focal areas, I picked um, three different examples that cut across the, the work we do um, as just representative examples that uh, we can talk about, although during the q and A, I'd be glad to talk about any of the areas across, uh, across mobility more broadly. So uh, elegantly just labeled example one. The, um, the, so first, uh, first topic I want to talk about really centers around this change in mobility and how do we, um, how do we measure it and how do we look at it and what's the government's role. There's trillions of dollars being spent today in automation and connectivity technology across automakers and others, Google, Lyft, Uber. Um, and when you look at all of those companies, all of that money, their goal, develop a vehicle, a single vehicle that can work perfectly with basically no reliability on anything else around it. It will certainly be connected to the cloud because it can use cloud-based computing, but not because it wants to understand uh, and, and communicate with other vehicles around it. And when you look at that, you know, their goal, if they're right, because auto companies can't rely upon other vehicles being there, the question that no one in our mind is really asking in a full enough way is what is the system level approach? What are system level impacts? So if you look now at multiple levels of automated vehicles, connected vehicles, micro mobility, change in freight movement, what's the total system level impact these are having? What's the impact to congestion, to affordability, to energy consumption? Um, so we basically created uh, a research program, part of it around trying to answer that question. So you know, kind of demonstrates right, the single vehicle, we understand that very, very well. We can model an individual vehicle virtually down at physics-based model, the aerodynamics, the engine, the shift patterns, no matter what fuel you want in it. We've taken that and looked at how do we take that vehicle and now model it in a corridor. Think about with the, all the vehicles it can see and, and sense right around it, plus the infrastructure it can see and sense around it. And then if you take that modeling, kind of a micro simulation, and we go up to more of a mesoscale simulation and then put that in the context of an entire city. So we've done that uh, now both with Chicago uh, as well as with the Bay Area, up to 11, uh, 11 million agents. These are agent-based modeling approaches, fundamentally asking the question, what is the system level impact? What are the second and third order impacts that you just really can't anticipate up front as new technologies might play out? And it's not a, not a forecasting attempt, it's really a simulation attempt to understand what does this technology do? What does that technology do? To help answer the question um, when uh, back, uh, I don't know, maybe a year or two ago, we were working a lot with um, Mandy and people in Columbus, and someone in Columbus asked, they said, I don't even know which direction, like it, maybe it was a question around TNCs, should we incentivize it, should we not? Is it gonna help, is it gonna hurt? Wh where will it help, where will it hurt? You know, um, those types of questions are really difficult to answer, and that's what we're trying to do here. So not to walk through the full model here, but um, it's actually a modeling workflow with multiple different models uh, embedded in together. But um, I wanted to give you a flavor because I think it will obviously apply to many, uh, many of the types of work that you do here. In most transportation-based modeling is basically modeling look at links and flows, um, relatively straightforward, simplistic model, but it's basically about how, build, how big do I have to build the road and where do I put the road? at its core or the, or the train. Um, the goal here was to use agent-based models where you're representing every individual person and then the decisions they're making and the technologies they're interacting with, as well as every package or piece of freight that's gotta move, essentially is also making decisions or people are making decisions for you about how to move that freight around. You're making decisions about how to order packages or order goods. You're making decisions about where to go to store. Those all interact. So we have the capability to model uh, existing technology, future technology, level four, level five automation, connectivity, micromobility services, uh, transit, and to look at the again, second, third order effects as you start changing some of these. So we're, the model is now, uh, and I guess a suite of models, this is a many multi-million dollar effort across the national labs, uh, operational, and our goal in the next year is to really start probing more deeply and then start to look at other cities as well uh, to understand its portability, but ultimately create a tool that 
maybe not in its full uh, national lab, you know, uh, high performance computing level uh, glory, but in a downsized version of it that can be available for cities and communities as they're asking the question and they're trying to figure out what uh, what they want to do with a specific technology, a policy, uh, et cetera. One key thing I'll know, I mentioned we had to come up with a new metric. So one of the things we had to ask is, what is the goal at the end? And um, I, I won't go into it too deeply here, but we basically created a new measure called mobility energy productivity, which is uh, very much a very geospatial based uh, metric. And it looks at the question of, for any given individual at any given point in a, in a geographic area, what are all my mobility choices? And how, what's the energy it would take, the cost it would take, the time it would take to, to get to all of those different choices? And then aggregating that for every person and every location across an urban area. We've actually shown the data is available to do that. We've done it now for dozens of cities, and we can now bake it into the model so you can look at when you have some things going up, some things going down, good or bad, at, at the end, did I improve the amount of mobility per unit energy cost and time from a particular change or set of changes? Um, I'll give you one example of an out outcome of being able to do this model. We looked at this question of package delivery in e-commerce and um, asked the question, so with significant increases in e-commerce, what's the net energy impact? Is it positive or negative? More local delivery trucks? Maybe more class eight trucks, maybe going to different locations, less individual person trips, more congestion. When you put all of that together and model all of it, it was pretty surprising. If you focus on this uh, chart here in the bottom right, uh, when you had three deliveries uh, a, a week average, so a household who typically sees three package deliveries, probably not that uncommon for many people today, um, there was an overall 40% decrease in energy consumption, largely due to decreased trips people take to the stores. And, uh, you know, I can anecdotally relate to it myself. I'm doing a little project at home, and I would run to Home Depot, which is about 20-minute drive away. I'd have to do that once a week before. Now, go order it, comes in. So I'm taking far less trips. I was wondering, am I, in the end, helping or hurting? Well, as it turns out, it's net-net um, a positive uh, energy-wise. So it's just using an example of the types of things you can, you can study and look at. All right, moving on completely to a completely different example. Um, lots of discussion today about electrification, certainly. And as I said, we are working as aggressively as anyone on electrification. But did a little um, thought experiment. So let's say we were at 20% next year electric vehicles. Magically, we could get there. We grow it up rapidly to 40%. By 2040, we're still going to have 60% of the vehicles on the road driving. And assuming you don't have some major change in kind of pulling vehicles off the road with some pull-ahead program that are using um, liquid fuels. Aviation, uh, we actually are working on electrification in aviation, but that's going to be more of an electric assist very much at the margin. Um, you're clearly going to have a lot of liquid fuels. Heavy-duty trucks are actually talking about electrifying more, but you're not going to electrify all of those. So we, if we're going to hit our goals uh, overall of a sustainable transportation system, we are going to need significant amounts of low-carbon fuel. There's no way around that uh, if you want to hit, you know, types of goals people are talking about in anywhere near a 2040 or 2050 time frame. So when you look at that question, what are the options for low-carbon liquid fuels? And it turns out there are a lot, a lot of options. We are working aggressively, certainly on uh, people think of biofuels. They think of uh, corn and ethanol. We are not working on that at all. There's a great corn ethanol industry today that's well-developed. We're looking at all the waste crops when you grow corn or wheat um, or you harvest trees for, uh, for building and lumber, all of that waste biomaterial, how can you translate that into fuels, municipal solid waste, growing algae, purpose-grown algae growth, um, liquid waste from farms as well as biosolids from uh, municipal wastewater treatment plants, these are, and plastics, these are all rich sources of carbon. And what turns out we can replace one-fifth of all the liquid fuel we use today from those biological sources. And the cost has come down dramatically. We've been investing uh, quite a bit. We've actually spent over $200 million a year in this area. The costs have come down in this area per gallon. We look at kind of the end gallon that you would have to get to uh, when you're uh, leaving, let's say, a, a factory gate so to get to, out to a customer. Our target is to get to $2.50. We've reduced the cost as much as batteries have come down in the cost in the last four years, about a 40% cost reduction. We're currently at about uh, 340 a gallon. Which uh, and you know we anticipate by uh, mid decade we will be starting getting closer to a point where you are in economical ranges to get there. However, there's a big challenge here. So um, one of my few busy charts I have here. If you look um, 
you look on the left, this gives you um, one, one example of one of the good feedstocks you could get is CO2, waste CO2, or CO2 from air capture. Air capture turns out to be pretty hard. So if you look in the chart on the left, um, that shows all of the different places where there are currently ethanol plants. There are quite a few. Ammonia plants, as well as natural gas wells, all basically places that have rich, clean sources of carbon. The chart on the bottom shows CO2 concentration. If you want to take CO2 and translate into something, you can't spend a ton of money to have to concentrate it. So you want a good concentrated source. You want to look at how many they have. But the other thing you need is hydrogen, right? You need to take the carbon and the hydrogen, and that would be true whether you're using CO2 or whether you're using all those different types of uh, material I talked about. So you think about municipal solid waste, you think about all that waste crop material, it's spread throughout the country. Now, some of it is uh, the, the biological routes tend to be more in the uh, areas around farm area. But on the chart on the right shows where we have wind power, which is key because where you have dispersed wind power, you are going to have excess electricity. We already have that in a lot of places that you can take that excess electricity and make hydrogen out of it. And then you have local hydrogen. But unlike today, much of our power today is a centralized story. In the future, it's going to be decentralized. And that's true in creating power for vehicles as well with liquid fuels or hydrogen. So this question of where the source of the energy is, how, where you translate it into a, a fuel or its energy source you're ultimately going to use and get it to its end user is going to be critical and it's completely different than what we, what we do today. All right, so last example here. Um, so on the trucking side, picture on the left, uh, anyone guess that that's a hub and spoke map from an airline? Anyone guess which one that is? Delta, because I lived in Detroit a long time, so I grabbed a Delta one. I worked uh, my early in my career actually on transportation uh, in aviation, and there was, before hub and spoke started, there was a question, should we have hub and spoke systems in, in aviation? They obviously have developed for a reason. Well, you look in the trucking sector today, the trucking sector has changed dramatically. The average trip of a long haul truck has gone from 500 miles to 300 miles in just the last four years. That's average. So you think about that, that's a dramatic change. What's happening is they've developed hub and spoke systems because they want to keep the drivers close at home at night, as well as some efficiency of operation, package delivery, all these things changing together. Well, when you look at that, it's very interesting that 50% of the goods by weight move less than 100 miles in this country, 75% move less than 250 miles. As a result of that, you all of a sudden you have a lot of businesses very interested in electrifying trucks and also um, in electrifying both full battery electric. Three or four years ago, the conventional wisdom was, you'll never electrify big trucks, class seven, class eight trucks. Well, that is very actively on the table today, as well as looking at, um, at hydrogen, which maybe is gonna be a little more practical, especially if you wanna go into that 250 to five, 600 mile range. But when you look at hydrogen, the, there's a lot of work that has to be done to get hydrogen costs down. We have technology roadmaps for all of it, but the one we don't have is how do you move the hydrogen to where it needs to be if you have dispersed use of hydrogen? It is just way too expensive and there's no good technological cost-effective pathway to do that uh, short of big pipelines and you have to have huge penetration for that. But if you look at trucking where you have centrally refueled vehicles and also if you look at places, um, this is actually a, a picture of what uh, Nikola is planning. You look at where that is, big desert. That's not a coincidence because they have big solar opportunity there. So if you can make electricity locally, make your hydrogen locally, not have to ship it, and have centrally refuel opportunity with fleets, all of a sudden, you have a hydrogen truck that now could be cost-effective. That's the first example of really cost-effective use of hydrogen vehicles that someone's really been able to put together. A lot of work still, but at least it's a plan that has, has a thought behind it. All right, with that, I'm, uh, I'm gonna wrap up there, and I uh, appreciate your, your attention. Look forward to having more, uh, more conversation later. One or two uh, quick clarifying questions before we move on to the panel. I guess I'll ask one, yeah. the chair prognate. So you, you mentioned that um, even with increased electrification, that we still are going to have 60% of our vehicles using using liquid fuels by 2040. I'm not clear about how biofuel solves, solves that problem because um, we still have the problem of a, of a vehicle stock that I mean, the average age of an automobile in the United States is like 10 years. So, um, so if you have low carbon, low carbon biofuels, our goal we're, is uh, we're developing full drop in biofuels. So basically imagine that can go drop into the vehicles that are on the road, a car, new car built today, uh, especially cars built 
maybe in the last five, six years, maybe even a little longer than that, all had pretty flexible calibration. So they could even change, take something that's a little off spec in fuel and probably work just fine. So if we have low, car- low carbon biofuels, basically allow you to burn those in the vehicles on the road, the net uh, carbon impact of those fuels is uh, about an 80 to 90% greenhouse gas reduction. So now, it does raise the question about local pollutants, though. And uh, part of the question, though, is if you're making a biofuel and you're molecularly tailoring the fuel uh, at that molecular level, can you do it so it is inherently less prone to making particulates? So that's one of the things we're looking at. Oh, Dan? Um, you mentioned the need for infrastructure for hydrogen. If we were to build pipelines, we have pipelines for natural gas all over the country. Why don't we just repurpose those? Uh, Two reasons. One, they're busy using it with natural gas. We are looking at injecting high. True. Um, we are looking at injecting hydrogen in up to five percent, maybe a little bit more. Uh, the other problem is you need some pretty significant upgrades on those um, in order to handle the hydrogen for the materials, because hydrogen being you know such a nice, beautiful, small, tiny element just nice to sneak into things. And um, so you would need upgrades, but theoretically you could. Would they be going to the right places, all of that? Because the idea of the, you know, yeah. So there would be some challenges there as well. Okay, with that, I think we'll move on to our panel. Then we'll have open discussion after our panel presentations. Um, We have three panelists this afternoon. Mary Leary serves as the Deputy to the Associate Administrator for the FTA, Federal Transit Administration, Office of Research, Demonstration, and Innovation. Did I get that right? Yeah, yeah, okay, sure. Um, I heard, probably heard some rumbling there. Um, Mary leads all operational and managerial, managerial functions to ensure the smooth operations of FTA's research office. She has over 34 years of experience leading fe- major federal programs spanning careers in the public, nonprofit, and private sector. Mandy Bishop serves as the Smart Columbus Program Manager and is responsible for delivery of the U.S. DOT and Paul G. Allen Family Foundation grant-funded programs. During her tenure, she has served as a Senior Project Manager with GPT Group, the staff lead for Ohio Governor's 21st Century Priorities Task Force, and Deputy Director of Planning for the Ohio Department of Transportation. And I'll be remiss if I don't mention that she has a BS degree in civil engineering from Ohio State University. And finally, Andrew Turner um, is an international man of mystery because I do not have a bio for him. So, so I'm going to ask him to sit, introduce himself. Sorry, yeah. Briefly. So as I mentioned, I'm the director and CTO of Esri's Research and Development Center in Washington, D.C. Previously, I was the CTO of GeoIQ. It was a startup that worked on building geospatial intelligence systems, both for the web, for consumer industry, as well as the intelligence community um, that was acquired by Esri in 2012. Prior to that, I was uh, founder of a nonprofit called Crisis Commons that was building crowdsourcing tools for disaster response for the World Bank and other institutions. My background's in aerospace engineering from UVA and Virginia Tech. Fantastic. Thank you. So we'll go in that order. Mary, uh, Mandy, and then Andrew. Mary, please. Great. Thank you. Well, I'm a social scientist, so I have to say when they were telling me to come talk about mapping and GIS, I thought, okay, how am I going to do that? So, but seeing all the parallels between Michael's presentation and mine, I think I'm on the right track. What I'm going to do is share a little bit about our program at FTA. By the way, I'm as is this working? Am I right? Okay. You ever know about the right distance? And then I want to drill down a little bit into smart communities and how does that relate to the trends that we're seeing in public transportation today? Because it is a very transformative time. And for many of the reasons that Michael's already talked about. And then lastly, I'd like to have one example of a very important program that I think highlights the role of, of really good navigation capabilities for people with disabilities. And there are many other areas that we can go to. Uh, button on the right. Thank you. Uh, to the right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. I do? Yeah. <coughs> I don't know. Let him drive for a second. Okay. 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 Sounds good. Perfect should be on the mission and priority slide. We'll start talking about it. So the mission at the Federal Transit Administration Office of Research, our statute says we exist to enhance public transportation through innovative research. We have three major research areas of priority, and they mirror Secretary Chow's strategic priorities for 
the whole department. One is developing and deploying innovation. Uh, second slide, please. The second is safety first, and it's actually always safety. Safety is number one. And lastly, it's mobility innovation. It's the mobility innovation side that I'd really like to drill down on a lot in this conversation. And our statute actually has a prescriptive pipeline process that we have to follow. So ideas sort of germinate in a research area, then we move into innovative development, and then we do demonstration and deployment. One of the things that my boss, Vince Valdez, likes to talk about is we have a grassroots predisposition to put most of our assets, about 70% of about the $160 million that we're currently managing today, in demonstration programs because our job is to really enhance the ability of public transit agencies to meet their mandates. Next, please. Okay. Should I try now? All right. There we go. Thank you. Well, interestingly enough, and a lot of times people don't realize just how pervasive public transportation is, but it's in 98% of urbanized areas, which is probably not a big surprise, but a bigger surprise is we're in 81% of the counties. Now, if you look at the slide over here on, on the right, the big map, that's by um, North Dakota State University. The white areas are areas where there are, are rural areas with no transportation. The red are urban counties with no ruralness to them. And then what's important though is if you look at both the dark green and the light green, those are areas where we have transportation um, associated with rural counties. So we're really existing in a lot of areas. Now it doesn't mean that we're everywhere we need to be. And then interestingly enough, one of the studies that has been done has shown that there is an intimate relationship between public transportation now and ride hailing services. We're seeing a very strong relationship. And we like to say it's first and last mile or in rural communities, and this is not my quote, but it's from a lady in Vermont, first and last 10 mile if you're in a rural community. <laughs> So one of the areas where we're using mapping is we just hired a data scientist and we're trying to move into data-driven research and research decisions around data. So this is actually a map of our research recipients. So some of the things that we're doing is we've developed a business intelligence system and then we're drilling down and analyzing our work from that perspective. And obviously that's really important when we're trying to make decisions on where do we want to make awards. Because if we've got two equal applicants, maybe we want to go to an area that we currently do not have um, a recipient. Now there are a lot of trends, and I love the term disruption. I was in the the te high technology industry for almost 20 years, and you talk about change, we went through transformative change. So a lot of the change management literature is, is it talks about things that I lived through. And what's truly fascinating for me is I actually think that public transportation today is going through what many industries have already gone through. And I believe that it will look very different five to 10 years from now, or even 20 years from now. I mean, I was talking to some folks um, from Kansas about Hyperloop. And I do think, you know, think about hub and spoke. And Hyperloop will probably be deployed at the same time that trans automation is going to be deployed. And they're going to serve two very, very different purposes. Obviously, bus technologies are very important, but also new technologies impacting operations like worker track identification. One of the things that we think um, will be very, very important is how do we ensure that as we move to more and more automated systems that the safety factor doesn't go away? And then, of course, we've got user adoption and travel expectations on real-time information. Smartphones are ubiquitous. Everybody has them. So now there's a desire to know exactly what is my transportation resource where do I get it? What does it cost? And many, many of our recipients right now are doing research in that area. So this is a mobility environment. As a matter of fact, when you were talking about micromobility, 84 million, that was actually something I was going to talk about. You know, I worked for Easter Seals at one time. I, I think of micromobility and scooters as, as real challenges for brain injury. Uh, I'd like to see helmets. Uh, but as you, when you look at it, though, we're really shifting the way people get to transportation resources. And that's going to make it available to more and more people as we enable folks to get to the stations. And that's really been one of our issues. Obviously, we use mapping for transportation demand management. And over the next 30 years, with the population changes that Michael was talking about, especially for older adults, you know, I actually was at the Department of Health and Human Services um, uh, and on the aging side. And it's interesting, most of the research that has been done on older adults has been done on older adults with dementia. So there's this perspective that older people will not be able to take public transportation and they t unless you grow up in it and you commute in an urbanized area. But if you think about how far the disability community has come, there probably are a lot of parallels that we can have between the two. So we think that this is a time of significant change and 
almost 21 billion, I think, of 121 billion dollars is the cost of what Americans spend stuck in traffic. And and I know Michael talked about it, but you think about street space. There really is a contraction of street space. We did an important meeting with our two advisory committees, the Federal Transit Administration and Federal Highways Advisory Committees, and that's a, a convened by the National Academies. The number one area that they all talked about was street space. So between transportation network companies and single or maybe two people in a vehicle, and then all of the deliveries, and then the ability for a, a, pa a passenger to actually get on, particularly if somebody uses a wheelchair, there are going to be a lot of issues as we go forward. So we talk about mobility services. You'll hear mobility on demand. Um, in Europe, it's MOS, mobility as a service. I think whatever you call it, the focus of many transportation agencies now, they're calling themselves mobility managers not necessarily public transit agencies. And the importance of pulling in both public and private assets is a critical component of where they're going. So the thing I wanted to talk about the most is drilling down into something called the complete trip. This is a concept that came from the Accessible Transportation Technology Research Initiative. And that initiative has been developed for, I guess, probably about eight years. Mohammed Youssef from Federal Highway started this a number of years ago. The reason why we like this concept is we feel it gives a framework for how do you assess the gaps in accessibility in a community and how do you develop solutions to address those gaps. And a lot of the areas, and on my next slide will go into more detail on the parts of the trip chain, really have to do with GIS and mapping and space and how, do, how you help somebody navigate using navigational aids. So this is a scenario, I kind of contracted the trip chains into, you know, these areas. The first area is how do you easily plan and book a trip? So if you think about all the mapping aids that are going to be necessary, particularly multimodally, it doesn't exist today. You cannot today plan a trip across the United States. The way in which we manage public transportation, it doesn't mirror the way people travel. People travel across public transit. Um, boundaries. They travel over states. They travel over counties. They travel, they travel across the United States. They take more than one mode. So how do you help plan and book a trip? Then second is how do you get to the transit station and how do you get there safely? Particularly if you are an individual who is blind, how do you do that with as much independence as possible? And there are a lot of new navigational aids that are making that possible, and I'm going to talk about a few. And then while you're on the bus, let's say an individual has um, a cognitive disability um, or an intellectual disability, being on the bus is something that is something that can be very um, anxiety producing for them. So how do we provide resources to help people as they do that? And then crossing the street, how do you get safely across the street for all pedestrians? I think probably many of you might know if you're driving a major bus and you're going left. So let's say a person is over here on, on this side of the street. The bus operator sees the pedestrian. The pedestrian sees the bus operator. But as that bus goes left, half of that street they can no longer see, but the pedestrian doesn't know that. So if you started to walk across the street, you think, oh, that bus saw me, but it's a real issue. So you actually watch bus drivers get out and contort themselves to look out the window. And we have a research program to look at bus compartment redesign, not only to help them with the issues with being able to effectively see to navigate the bus correctly, but also for safety reasons too. We've got a lot of issues there. And then arriving at the destination safely. These are all the different types of uh, projects that we have. I could go into a lot of them, but I want to just drill down on this one. And so smart wayfinding, pre-trip concierge, robotics and automation, safe intersection crossing. I thought this might um, gel into what you're talking about in terms of smart communities and the use of technologies to help people get around. Here are some examples, and I'm not go going to go deeply because I want to um, close off, my 10 minutes is up, but we are doing a lot with a number of our research recipients in terms of wayfinding and navigation, and it's very exciting to see. It's interesting, GPS is not a very good way to get around if you are a person with a disability or you are blind. It's not very accurate. It'll actually send you into a building. So we have to have a lot of new navigational aids um, and technology to help people get around. These are some of the other things we're doing. Um, Carnegie Mellon's doing a lot of work over there. And then robotics and automation hold a lot of promise for people as well. 
So here's some links and resources. And when you look at where we're going in terms of a lot of the resources that we have from a mapping perspective, you know, we work closely with Esri. You showed the ARC GIS online. Federal Highway has ATP GIS. Probably many of you are familiar with these resources. So there are a lot of other activities that we're doing um, to enhance smart communities from the planning side with a lot of GIS and um, resources associated with mapping. With that, I'll turn it over to my next colleague. Okay, thank you. Mandy? Andrew will go last. What? Andrew will go last. Yeah. Okay. Unless the slides are queued up differently, but nope. Looks like. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all for hosting me here today. Um, just a little bit of context about Smart Columbus. It is an informal public-private partnership uh, between the City of Columbus and the Columbus Partnership, which is an org a membership organization that enlists the top 75 CEOs um, in Central Ohio, with uh, the City of Columbus being the lead on the grant delivery program. Um, in 2016, we were, we were awarded the Smart City Challenge uh, opportunity. We won $40 million from the U.S. Department of Transportation as well as $10 million from the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation to electrify our transportation sector. Our mayor firmly believes that mobility is the great equalizer. So um, much like uh, Michael shared, transportation is fundamental. And when I took over this program a little over two plus years ago, I re this was a little bit too esoteric for me. And I really had to think back to when I turned 16, got that car with four different tires and an AM radio. And after I got past the initial kind of like disappointment of that, I realized that I could get to softball, my job, and to school. And transportation for me has always really been an enabler. And so for it to be a barrier um, to others in the community, just getting up every day and just having to get past that first hurdle to get to what the things I want to do, it, it was just something that really drives me and my team uh, to, to delivery. Uh, our vision is to really empower our residents to live their best lives through responsive, innovative, and safe mobility options. And our mission is to demonstrate how intelligent transportation systems and equitable access to those systems can really help uh, really help uh, tackle uh, challenges that our residents are facing every day in cities. And so when we won the grant, um, we really focused on two components. We focused on electrifying our transportation sector. And this is the area where we've probably struggled with equity the most, electrification. The early adopter is not your eye, uh, or is, is your eye. It's the uh, middle high income earner, highly educated. Um, but we've really been focusing on that shared component to help drive uh, electrification throughout our community and access to electrification. Um, our five Vulcan priorities include 42 different initiatives. And we really, as a city, had to kind of double down on how we were going to really tackle some of these issues. This was relatively new. And through a partnership with NRAIL, uh, with uh, the National Re Renewable Energy Lab in Colorado, working with Dr. Stan and, and some of his team, our first map actually was a hotspot location where the zip, zip codes were with the most EVs that were sold in Central Ohio. So that was really a starting point for us going, okay, what are going to be, what's going to be our key decision and drivers for making the, uh, decisions about where we're going to place electric infrastructure? We got to start with our downtown region and looking at what was there and then looking at places we wanted to really develop um, partnerships with where we had the electric infrastructure, et cetera. And so we came up with a process for identifying publicly accessible charging locations. And we really focused on, again, the origin. Where were the, where were the EVs being sold and used? Uh, where were trip destinations? Where, where was it mostly work, workplace? Um, where, where was more charging needed? Did we already have some prevalence of charging in the area? And then what type of charging was, you know, most needed? Is it going to be a level one, level two, that DC fast charging? Um, and some of the things that we also prioritized were looking at where we were going to hit that interim trip, like maybe people that were traveling cross country and they could start to have that gas station model and we could put uh, DC fast charging just off the interstate, but still in our central business district that could also serve some of our, our transportation uh, network companies as well. And so ultimately we ended up uh, advancing uh, an initiative that really looked at charging infrastructure, uh, where we could place charging infrastructure, where we had a need, where our um, electric grid could really take you know, had the capacity to support it, um, where we had 
you know, when you have an inform- when you have a public-private partnership, it's great to leverage the private sector. We had a lot of locations that were accessible to us, like Nationwide Children's Hospital. We had AEP as a huge partner. Um, Walmart was getting in the game with, uh, you know, opening up some of their massive amounts of parking to us to put those uh, DC fast chargers. Um, and Kroger, various other partners throughout the region that were really stepping up and helping us locate on their property. And so the U.S. Department of uh, Transportation grant portfolio is a little bit different. We're really focused on mobility in this uh, in this uh, portfolio, and it's all anchored by our Smart Columbus operating system, which is an integrated data exchange or data management platform. It is available. It's open source. Uh, it's built on Ur- uh, Elixir, an open source code language. It is available at um, uh, SmartColumbusOS.com, and, uh, .com. and then it's also the source open source code is available at GitHub.com/smart. City data. Uh, it's available for your use and exploration. Um, our, pr- our program is organized in really three themes, uh, enabling technologies, enhanced human services, that's a lot of our, a lot of our apps that are using the maps, um, and then emerging technologies. And so one of our major projects that we're launching is a pretty significant connected vehicle environment. It is about 23 23 mile uh, long corridor and through our uh, high street which is one of our busiest corridors in Columbus it goes through the heart of Ohio State University's campus on the east side Uh, Cleveland Avenue which goes through an opportunity neighborhood uh, has a lot of uh, low-income residents which have which were historically disturbed by a large interstate construction project much like many communities Um, and then also a very diverse corridor in Morse Road with a lot of commercial residential strip malls back to office, shopping, so just a a broad range of different applications. And so when we were launching um, our connected vehicle environment, and we're really getting close to launch next July, we knew that we were going to have to develop our map message. So for us, we've been looking at how we wanted to best do that. And so we we looked at a U.S. Department of Transportation's ISD tool and their map messaging tool. But we knew we needed really good mapping. They have a disclaimer that says, hey, localize this, you know, check it out. And so we really had to get into what what aerial photography we wanted to use in order to uh, deploy this technology. So we used our Ohio geographical referenced uh, information data, and we accessed uh, several online uh, tool, other several other maps uh, in order to really evaluate um, our system. And ultimately, we ended up, and I'm missing a. Ultimately, we ended up using uh, the tool to, we went with some ground truth, latitude and longitude uh, co- coordinates. And then we also had some challenges where the X and Y coordinate weren't the same on different uh, different maps. And then finally, we had to use imagery. We had to look at the different time periods of the imagery. Uh, but ultimately, we ended up being able to use our Ohio Geo, uh, our OGRIP data and aerial mapping because it was the most recent. It was the one that was aligning with our uh, ground truth points in order to insert that information into the uh, ISD tool uh, from USDOT. Um, one of the other projects that we're launching is our uh, self-driving shuttle. We already launched one self-driving shuttle last year. Uh, it launched actually in December of 2017 and or December of 2018 and went through September of this year. It was with May, a company called May Mobility. Um, and our next self-driving shuttle is being launched with um, a company called Easy Mile, and Easy Mile uh, basically uses a uh, lidar and c- to collect it, collect information about their uh, surroundings. We set a base map, and then we operate based on that information. Um, we are deploying in one of the first uh, residential settings in Columbus. We're deploying in our Linden neighborhood, which is an opportunity neighborhood, which presents some unique challenges from the mapping perspective. Uh, specifically, we have a lot of um, interactions in the area. We have about eight or nine schools. Um, we have a large residential par- uh, population where we're parking on the street. So the uh, self-driving shuttle is going to have to map um, from you know, that not only the curb line to curb line, but also those those parked vehicles. We're, uh, we are actually installing some additional infrastructure with center line uh, mapping in order to help the vehicle um, uh, help the vehicle uh, in, interpret the information that it's, it's receiving. Um, but ultimately, 
um, that that's the type those are the types of challenges that we're facing as we launch uh, new mobility in the, the central Ohio uh, area and so I'm a civil engineer by trade, and I've been working most of my career in transportation. And I've been in private sector most of my career. I've had a stint in state government, and now have transitioned to local government. And what you know, we're accustomed at, to uh, as civil engineers planning, designing, and constructing using mapping and survey. And what we're really being called on now is to ensure that 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 mapping is accurate enough to operate our transportation system, specifically when it comes to the connected and automated vehicles and the other types of apps and maps that we're deploying. Specifically, we're deploying a trip planning application as well uh, that is drawing on a open streets methodology. And we're, so we're really, um, as a local government, we're we're learning. We're on the you know a little bit on the bleeding edge, and sometimes just on the cutting edge. Um, we uh, are hoping, you know, as this technology continues to emerge, that there um, is more you know more guidance out there, and then also that we uh, that we start to acquire the the business the business acumen and the knowledge internally to help us support what's coming. Um, government doesn't always like attract. Uh, the, the best and the brightest. They're going to industry. Sometimes they're chasing the dollars, although I see many bright people in government. Uh, we need some of those industry experts in order to um, help us advance as a city and be ready for the transformations that are already here at our doorstep in uh, transportation and technology. Finally, Andrew. Man of mystery. Man of mystery. Got my presentation. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to talk through a, a number, a few patterns that we're seeing, as well as some examples. I can't be comprehensive to all of the things that Esri works on, or we see the industry and, and um, governments working on, but I'll highlight a few that I'm particularly thinking about here. Um, so I'm going to show these couple examples, uh, taking on what we, we look at the science of where in terms of how do we uh, not only enable geospatial technology, but enable deeper thinking with geospatial technology. But I can make sure the mute muted too. Thanks. Um, let's see if this also works or not. I had to go under the table. Interesting. Nope. <laughs> nope. Behind my head. Behind the table. You can just forward. It's not advancing. So a couple of new technologies, or at least pat uh, types of classes of new technology that we're seeing growing at scale. And I'll go drive into some deeper numerical trends, but we're seeing obviously a, a plethora of sensors, sensor types, sensor granularities, um, sensor sources. Uh, data is becoming increasingly open and available through numerous sources, numerous formats um, uh, of different types of data. Uh, the use of mobile technologies, so even the CPU processing power in our pockets and our watches that are, that are rapidly um, growing, cloud computing, and finally, quote, big data uh, writ large. Great. So, yeah, mute. just background static. Um, so this is an example of looking just alone at Manhattan um, and just the, the, the wealth of data we just pulled together in a simple exploration, but it gives you access to all of the camera footage, which is not, in, it's now becoming a, a very common thing to do in terms of accessing cameras that are placed all around cities. And this is just, just the publicly available ones, not including the ones being embedded in every single light pole and school all around the city. And this is just one city. So it's interesting to see now what you can do with this kind of data and this kind of information. Forward. So we're doing things like feature extraction, capturing the number of vehicles and the vehicle speeds and things like that in terms of lanes that are usage, um, as well as capturing things like pedestrians. This is in a new ballpark where they're actually using the cameras to understand how people exit the stadium, how they cross the street, what happens when you go over capacity and people spill out of the sidewalk into the street as they're walking along it or jaywalk across the street. So not only does it help a city better understand what's really going on, not just its you know, models, but actually helps them to respond. Within seconds, they can change light timings. They can make the entire four-way stop a red light um, while the entire, that crowd is moving across the intersection. And they can send police off if they have to, but they can actually control their infrastructure at a moment's notice utilizing these cameras. So what we're seeing is this pattern of identifying a goal, analyzing the results, acting on it, and then having the outcome occur. And this is a very common, this is simple, you know, action. Um, but the important here is the idea of sensing, and that's the trend we're seeing here is not just this closing this feedback loop, but the rapid iteration and micro scale this is occurring. This is occurring at street intersection levels, at individuals, at paces, at um, mobility and motion, at millisecond responses. So what happens when you have all of that amazing data? 
So this is Nick O'Day. He's the chief data officer for Johns Creek, Georgia, a small town outside of Atlanta. And he's highlighting the change in government where it's not just paving the entire city and the, every road just because it's been 10 years time to pave it. He can utilize this data in GIS to surgically fix problems. Understand, can we fix this, this one pothole? Is this street repeatedly breaking? What about this pipeline in terms of this water main? Is it breaking at some periodic interval based on average temperature over so many days? So it enables him to act more efficiently and with um, better uh, budgetary constraints, uh, resource constraints, and actually provide better services to his residents. This is an example that just finished in Washington, D.C., where they didn't know their what was called a curb inventory. Where was all of the parking in the city? What hours was it available, and how is it being used? Yet curbs are a fixed resource that have become increasingly valuable, as we've heard, the number of trips going up. Being able to optimize the use of the limited curb space you have is imperative for cities, for cities to be able to move cars along. So what happens is now they've inventoried all the spots. They identified um, temporary pickup drop-off zones, PUDs, where people can reserve that at 30-second intervals. So so uh, FedEx can say, I'm going to deliver a package of shoes. They can say, great, here, go to spot four. You have it for 30 seconds, unload, and you're back in the car. Um, they can do it for Uber drivers. So you're not picked up right in front of the building. Maybe go to the end of the street. There's a pud. Walk in your car and out. And this is optimizing both the parking spaces as well as the utilization of the curb for micro interactions. So another trend we're seeing is the increased adoption of just the internet globally. So over 50% of the world now has access to the internet. So it's not you know, uh, completely pervasive, but it's essentially something which you can just assume ha is accessible definitely in the United States across most urban, suburban, and even rural areas now. Next. So you now have, now that the internet was just driving consumer demand, you now have smart devices which are connecting the internet um, at increasingly um, fast-growing scale. The number of devices has already double, exceeded, quote, double the population of the world. And it's amazing not just the devices, but what data they're capturing. This is looking at one um, uh, car with laden with sensors. You imagine an autonomous car sensing all of the spaces, the trees, the curb, the bicycles, the cars around them. It's called HD mapping or high-definition mapping. So it's capturing an incredible amount of data just to safely navigate through the existing road infrastructure. But when you start thinking of what's actually going on here is what the data can now be used for is not just navigating that one car, but now we know in real time how cars move and all types of vehicles move through our cities, which improves for urban planners not knowing just, you know, here's the number of vehicles we see per day on average or the 85th percentile speed. I can tell you Tuesday at 2 p.m. after a baseball game, when it's been raining for half an hour, here's the average speed. Here's how people move through our city, how they traverse, how they navigate to optimizing, um, you know, changing roads, infrastructure, transit, and so on. And then looking at the autonomous cars, and this is kind of another pattern I'll get into, is that each connected car uh, is sending 25 gigabytes of data to the cloud every hour. It's an incredible amount of data and information, which you think of not only just sending to the cloud to process it, but overwhelming every single communication infrastructure along every single roadway across the country. You take that, multiply 25 gigabytes per hour across trillions of, of, of road trips per day or per year um, is immense. It's overwhelming. Simply put, the cloud can't scale. So what happens next? Next. <laughs> So there's a pattern called edge computing. And you see this pattern go back and forth a lot, from mainframes to, to personal computers, to servers, to the web, to mobile devices, and back and forth. And you're seeing the same thing now happen in smart devices. And the Internet of Things isn't just something sensing, sending it back. It's actually processing the data on the device or sharing that information between one another. So we're seeing overall this pattern going from individuals working on data or individual devices capturing their data to collaborating together around them, so fleets of vehicles and organizations. So now networks of organizations, ad hoc data sharing between devices in terms of making intelligent decisions at the point of both measurement and action. So really shortening that feedback, feed, feedback loop. Mobile devices themselves are increasingly gaining, uh, becoming ubiquitous and powerful, right? There's the common trope about the cell phone right now has about 100 times the computing power of the Apollo landing craft, right? What happens now when you can capture that data and process it on your device to make those real-time decisions um, at the moment that you're carrying it? So one example of this is, is Waze, where Waze is capturing both government data um, as well as road data. Um, so it's actually taking, like, taking this data and providing it back to governments to optimize how people move through the city. Boston is one example to decrease their traffic congestion by 18% by analyzing this ways data and changing signal timing, so similar to pedestrians. It's nice, also interesting as a collaboration is the, the while Waze knows what's going on right now, the government knows the future. They're telling through Waze open data sharing what road's about to be closed in half an hour, so don't route me through there. Don't cause congestion before it even occurs. 
And they start mixing these things together. This is uh, a project by David Maidman at the University of Texas for flood modeling, and, and par pardon me if it was mentioned this morning. But they're able to do national flood mapping um, in just a few minutes um, based on real-time emergent um, rainfall data. It's a 10-meter resolution, but it's good indication is something about to flood here based on our predictions and models and the current conditions that are occurring. So marrying these two things together, Waze is actually taking and putting this data into their routing information where they're saying rainfall is occurring, likely to cause a flood on this route. Why don't you take a different route? Um, in this case is here, which is one example where if that can be due, due to Harvey, people could get out more quickly. But even on a daily basis, having people avoid that bridge, avoid that underpass, just because that information data and that prediction model that might be, even be running in their car could tell them to avoid that route. And we're looking at different kinds of mobility um, types. This is looking at bicycling. So you have dockless bike shares and scooters, which are also geolocated and sensor laden, which are sharing their routing and information. So being able to optimize both the placement of these vehicles, which is occurring today, but also the routing and optimization of them as they move through the city. And as I mentioned before, even understanding in this case, New York City, how it changes by time of day, for example, on a Friday, which as you can kind of imagine, both people go home and commuting, but even if you went on later in the evening where people go at, at the evening, where are they converging to? So dr drilling even to the devices themselves, so the idea I mentioned, the, the wearable watches, the, the wearable um, uh, glasses, all these devices that are being embedded everywhere has doubled in the last four years alone. So 52 million devices, wearable, uh, wearable users in the U.S. alone. So what happens when you do with this, what can you do with this information to augment how people actually interact with their environment around them? So we're seeing these being used for augmented reality. We talked about flooding earlier in the Q&A, but using it for both operational um, procedures. For example, being able to view the underground um, pipelines, electrical lines within a road infrastructure, or being able to overlay information, um, telemetry, and real-time data on the environment around you for everything from navigation, wayfinding, um, operations, and so on. Although it's interesting to see, and part of what's always fun in these scenarios is imagine the future is what happens if it's taken to an extreme. Uh, this is the Brick Iron Building. This is actually um, Snap Photo, which is a very popular consumer photo sharing app, is now explore, exploring augmented reality, layering data on top of buildings in which people are exploring things like, what happens if I make my building look like pizza? But the idea here is merging these together where augmented reality might be an amazing technology, but who's going to come and download that new app? But can you get that kind of technology into consumer devices and consumer programs so it gets as accessible as possible to as many people as possible? So we're seeing ubiquitous pervasive information access through consumer services. I mentioned Snap, mobile phones, watches, Alexa devices, and chatbots, and Facebook. These are two examples that we've worked on where people are using their Alexa to ask data of what's going on around their house. When's my next council meeting? What's the weather today? Which route should I take? Where's my nearest trash day? So exploring the idea of not requiring people to come to an information system so much as taking the information and put it into the systems they already use. And so we're seeing a pattern of expanding GIS to support everyone, not just the government and the organizations and the commercial agencies, but also consumers, researchers, scientists, um, residents, and, and students. So we're seeing ocean data, for example, become ubiquitously available so people can get involved in advocacy and, and operations. I'm trying to end quickly. We're seeing crowdsourcing and citizen science. So taking this idea of computing to the edge to its extreme, where really it's about the people themselves and how they can utilize this data to provide computing and provide feedback and answers. So this is in Zvola, Netherlands, who heard earlier when just data aren't, uh, or sensors aren't equally distributed, they've actually designed a um, flooding sensor that costs less than 100 euros to build, and communities themselves are building them, installing them, and measuring, sending all their data back to, to um, the city, because so people can measure their backyard, um, their underpass, areas that might not be infrastructure censored by the city itself, but they can provide that data back through these sensors so they can have a more comprehensive view of what's going on in their city. We're seeing neighborhood councils start to train up their citizens on utilizing open data and geospatial technology to optimize um, services delivery. In this case, where should we put trash cans around our city? So an innocuous example, but indicative of the pattern that we're seeing here. And then you look at more broadly, the global to local um, calls to action as well as um, guidelines. So United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are creating a call for increasing the re availability of high quality, timely, reliable data based on demographics and geospatial and geographic location. So for example, um, I encourage all of you next April to join the Earth Day Challenge. It's a citizen science initiative in which they're trying to crowdsource a billion data points in one day. And then for the next year, get people involved in analyzing that data around things like food supply, drinking water, water quality, um, air quality, and so on. So th these calls to action for accessing and utilizing the data through sensors that people already care carry in their pockets, through tools they might already use to answer questions that are imperative about their livelihood, is something that's becoming increasingly common. 
So we're seeing that all over the world. We're seeing organizations start up their own initiatives around these programs and projects and the data, utilizing national and global data with locally crowdsourced data to improve policy and improve infrastructure. So um, I'll leave this up here for a second, but just a few questions that I've, I've seen uh, that we're thinking about, trying to think about the merger between, or the, the conflation between the Mapping Sciences Committee and Geographic Sciences Committee in particular, or there's questions of um, geographic analysis of, of synthesizing crowdsourced data and authoritative and automated data. Methods for geospatially sharding, distributed edge processing systems. Um, how, do you, how do you analyze data within each of these cells, aggregate, aggregate them back together and pass back down um, uh, regional or global insights. Visualization, cartographic techniques where we heard um, both um, medium or mixed quality data as well as real time and emergence data. And then finally, techniques for effective interactive geolocated AR and VR, right? So just because you can do AR, does it actually have an effect? Do people understand it? Does it change behavior? Not as definitely an area ripe for exploration. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for the keynote address and also three really interesting uh, panel presentations. Uh, I think all our minds are, are really racing right now surrounding these possibilities. Um, we're open for questions. Uh, again, please use your microphone and please, please introduce yourself. Those are really interesting presentations. Oh, Glenn McDonald, UCLA. Those are really interesting presentations. Thank you. I had a question, and uh, in Michael's presentation, you talked a lot about hydrogen and biofuel. And um, Mandy and yours was all about electrical. So uh, I'm, I'm interested to know if you have any data on what, if you look at, take a life cycle analysis of a battery powered electrical vehicle, right? and then you take a hydrogen-powered vehicle or a one that you have a, a tank-ready biofuel. Uh, how, how, how well are we doing environmentally with the battery-powered vehicle, actually? The, um, there's a model uh, at Argonne National Lab called the GREET model that I encourage you to use, G-R-E-E-T. It's, it's open source. It is, um, it is recognized globally as the, by the best life cycle assessment tool. And like many things, it just depends on what your assumptions are. Um, so in the case of electrification, it depends what your grid resources are. So if you look at national, uh, national average grid levels, you're doing quite well in a greenhouse gas reduction basis with electrification. If you look at specific uh, sub-regions, most regions you're doing very well. There's only a few that currently have really high penetration of coal, but that's not the case. And certainly if you look globally in the future where uh, I, I'm constantly at meetings and discussions where I hear utilities, states, others with goals of, you know, north of 80% renewable penetration. Um, so depending where you are with nuclear, if you, you know, if you have a very high level of renewables and certainly globally, uh, the level of renewables are approaching already high levels and, and are going to continue to grow. Electrification will do very, very well. Uh, it will probably, of the different pathways, when, when you look across them, um, biofuels and electrification uh, probably are have your best overall pathways. Hydrogen, if you make, today you make hydrogen from steam methane reforming from natural gas, uh, so it has a greenhouse gas reduction versus petroleum, but not as good as if you make it from an electrolyzer, but it's not cost effective to make hydrogen through electrolyzers today, so we're trying to work that cost down. If you can do that, um, and then of course you have to have the electricity from a renewable source as well. But in general, all of those technology pathways you know, today are, are strongly greenhouse gas positive, and in the future they look to be much more so. Um, yes, hi, I'm Grady Tool, uh, 3D Ideas on the Mapping Sciences Committee. Uh, so to my colleagues on uh, MSC, um, we, uh, we have kicked around for a couple of years now uh, uh, just our, our, our thinking about route finding and autonomous vehicles. And uh, so Mary, uh, you being the DOT person here, I'm going to ask you a question actually related to Mandy's presentation. So, um, <laughs> Ma Mandy, you, you outlined beautifully uh, the hard work required to sort of fix and constrain the route finding uh, in Columbus, right? So I'm, I'm wondering, is, is, there, is there thinking at the national level about uh, scaling this? And how do we get to a consistent set? For example, just recently I was in Huntsville and I, I, I often will drive, you know, let my my Ford vehicle navigate while I'm, I've got another something else going on in my iPhone, 
either Google Map or uh, IMAP, and they all very frequently don't agree. But there was a situation uh, that I, I personally came into in Huntsville two weeks ago where if I had sort of blindly followed what my Ford was telling me to do, I, I, I would have run into a road that didn't exist. So how, how, do we, how do we get to a national program that addresses this, or is there one? There definitely is. We've had a huge focus on automated vehicles for quite a while. We've just put out and released the winners of $100 million invested in automated um, development technologies. We are also on the transportation side. We have something called the STAR plan, the Strategic Tran Transit Automation Research Plan, and it's available on our website. And it articulates all the various elements that we think are really important, particularly when you're looking at transit automation and public transportation. So an area that we're very concerned about right now is bus testing. We run bus testing out of the Office of Research. Right now, we test a bus really for durability and some safety features, but we don't do anything to test software. You know, and having come from a, the technology, high technology industry, and, you know, you just look around, we're going to have to reevaluate how we test vehicles with the new technologies. We have partners, luckily, that have a lot of capabilities in that. Some of our partners have a lot of capabilities as well as in cybersecurity, which is going to be another area that we're going to have to look at. So I would say that absolutely it's one of the top areas that we've been focusing on. We just did, we've done a number of big events at DOT recently. We've done them on automation. We just did one on accessibility, kind of why I was talking about this. The secretary herself just announced something called the Complete Trip Deployment Program. And as, as a lot of the leaders in the disability community talked about, when you can fix the challenges that they face, it benefits everybody. And that's one of the reasons why we love, often like to talk about it. So I hope that answers your question. Um, so uh, I'm also just interested in the legal aspects of this problem. Um, so uh, it, from a, a, a mapping point of view, we often sometimes re refer to the difference between a chart and a map, in that a chart is something with some uh, legal implications that you're going to navigate a vehicle from it and it better be right. Uh, so that's kind of the flavor that I'm asking about here is, is how, do we, how do we know that it's right and who has liability if it's wrong in, the, in a future context, of course. Well, I think those are the types of very complex and important questions we're going to have to answer. I don't think we have good answers right now, um, but that's certainly going to be an area of inquiry as we look at all of the governance aspects, because oftentimes the technology is, I wouldn't say it's the easy part, but in, when you deploy it, it's often the governance factors associated with deploying these technologies that get in our way, as well as user adoption. So I think that's a wonderful point, and it's one that I hope that you'll continue to ask us to address if you're not seeing us address it. One one added comment on that. I think when you look in the future, one of the comments that Andrew made and others, the technology is able to kind of create its own maps in real time while it's actually doing what it's supposed to be doing, navigating other things. I think there'll be a question out there of how do you share mapping data? Is it that individual companies are improving their own maps? Can they share those maps or not? Um, are there some that are better than others? There's a lot of nature of that because the map data will be will be critical to a lot of the self-driving technology. Go ahead, Mark. So I'm just curious. Uh, there was an earlier discussion about uh, vehicle charging stations. And uh, in terms of a life cycle and moving a smart city forward, um, have, you, have you looked at or developed any kind of policy or, or workflow to talk to new construction versus existing construction and how that cost efficient, uh, the coefficient must be radically different for retrofitting how do you work with facilities owners to, to encourage the installation and the proper operation of these things? Yeah, so a couple things that we've A couple things that we've approached from a policy standpoint. First of all, it's about $20 for the conduit to install if you're building new construction, if you put it in with the building, with the parking garage. It's about $200 a linear foot uh, to install post. So a little about a 10 time cost differential just in a parking garage type setting. That's where we built the most infrastructure. Um, we uh, are just beginning to start to start our outreach with the uh, residential construction as well as the commercial construction folks to determine to set a uh, new construction policy with our building and zoning services to help, help make uh, new construction EV ready. Um, at least at a minimum put in the conduit to run the wire, set the panel up from the get-go to accommodate the charging infrastructure 
And so that's part of our demonstration program and our learnings is that we want to go out and actually get that implemented into our, our zoning code. We, there's also, um, when you look at the non-residential space, the charging power levels, right, are changing and going to change. We're working on extreme fast charging. Today, 50 kilowatt, maybe 110 is your higher level. We're looking at 350, well above that for trucks. Um, as we've talked to the people who are spending billions putting infrastructure in place, um, they have largely been able to figure out how to future-proof that, the people like Electrify America or utilities. Uh, so that has not turned out to be as big a problem as we would have thought it was. They'll, you know, how do you be smart about putting in enough now and upgrading later? Uh, yeah, as an, as an EV owner, it's a big location problem. Um, uh, again, I didn't identify myself, Mark Reichert, OGC, Open Geospatial Consortium Mapping Science Committee, but I think this is a huge location challenge, uh, one of just uh, locating these devices, but also um, ensuring that the, the uh, capability is there, the, the, the capacity is there. And the, uh, I guess the automation and apps are moving in that direction? With respect to the EVs, I, I mean, we've largely focused on residential and workplace charging deployments. 85% of charging is done really at home, and then the remainder is uh, at the workplace. So that's wh that's where we've gotten a lot of leverage with respect to our with for the with the uh, 10 million dollars that we got from Paul G. Allen Foundation. They really they'd already paid for a bunch of infrastructure in whole, and so they wanted us to really incent placement. And we knew with almost all of our new construction in Columbus right now is rental this multi-unit development that we really had to be in those uh, locations and then also in the workplaces. Okay, we have questions from Dan Brown and Buddha Baduri. Dan? Uh, yeah, Dan Brown, University of Washington Mapping Science Committee. Um, I, I'm struggling with a, a conversation we had earlier in the morning. Um, and I will uh, admit to being a little weird in that I'm a pedestrian. And all this talk of making vehicles easier to move around in urban space make me nervous. I'm already scared sometimes to walk around the urban environment, and this notion of walling off pedestrian or somehow making sure that the world is safe for autonomous vehicles, uh, it's, it's not a world that I want to live in. And so I, I, I guess I want to go to the questions of how we balance uh, livability and mobility. And um, is there a mapping planning element to that? That uh, it seems as though there's certainly it's a geospatial problem, um, but it's not necessarily one that I've heard anybody talk about. In, in Columbus, it's relatively – so we – 85%, 89% of people get in the car every morning and go to and from work in Columbus. It's relatively easy to drive. Um, a lot of the conversation for us right now is getting more people to use public transit, which ultimately is going to require them to use some feet to get there. Uh, I would say that we do a – I'll let Harvey rate, he affirm this, but we do a, a, a less than a uh, job of getting our roadways really well equipped uh, to accommodate all the users, inclu including vulnerable road users. It's very much part of the conversation, but and I don't want to really pivot the conversation completely, but for me as a city leading the Smart City Challenge, it's really been an opportunity to work with researchers like Harvey and others that are uh, bikers and pedestrians to really uh, start to understand how research vulnerable user, uh, VRUs can actually help us drive the conversation a little bit better um, and really start to transition our thinking. So we as a region, I think, are really pivoting to focusing on transit. And by, uh, by extension, I believe that those conversations ha are, were ripe for those to be driven in a little bit better way. But you're absolutely right. One of our conversations with NHTSA has really been the interaction between AVs and pedestrians, bicyclists, and ensuring, because we are in that first real residential deployment in the country, uh, that that deployment will produce a lot of data. But ultimately, I want to see more people using their feet and getting on their cars, including myself. And if I can follow up that question before I turn over to you, Pudu, uh, I'm wondering, and this is, oh, did you want to speak first, Mary, or? Oh, no, I can wait after that, but I'll... Okay. 
apologies for jumping in there, but uh, it's a related question. Um, I, I'd like to know what the implications are of this for basic street design. I mean, that's something that I don't see in all this smart technology stuff is we're trying to throw information technology, data, and computation to these problems. How are we changing our, the fundamental way that we design streets so that we can accommodate a wider um, role of users, wider, wider range of users besides just automobiles? Is there some way we can use this data to figure out how do we make our streets safer for the Dan Browns of the world and the Harvey Millers for that matter. There actually is a lot of work going on in this area, but I think we oftentimes don't talk about it in concert with um, high technology discussions on automation. But if you think about transit-oriented development, and you almost think about it, it's interesting when you look at history. Many, many years ago, um, we had street, the cities really where people were they congregated. We didn't have you know, any kind of vehicles. Then the horse and buggy came around, and then the cars came around, and then we lost our streetscapes to pedestrians. Mm -hmm. Now, in many places, it's coming back. And a lot of communities, I mean, in Denver, there's a big project that they did, and, you know, we've increased the access to pedestrians and, and walkways, and we've reduced the ability to park cars and even bring cars into many areas. So I think that's happening simultaneously. You know, you've got the Complete Streets initiative that's been going on for a lot of years. And then we have small business innovation research projects that are looking at how do we ensure pedestrian safety with buses in public transit. So I think it's happening, but it's an interesting point you're bringing up that we don't talk about it when we're talking about um, automation, and maybe that's something that we should change. The, you know, if you automation, fully automated vehicles certainly have a long way to go technologically. But if you gave me my choice of living in a city that had no automated vehicles or and being a walker a lot here in DC or very, very high level automated vehicles, purely from a safety perspective, I'd absolutely take the automated vehicle one. Absolutely. Because you think about to the degree when you get automated a lot of the promise of automated vehicles, a lot of the drive is the underlying safety benefits. Now, I don't know how many of you've driven in a fully automated vehicle before, but I mean it's gonna be like driving in, you know, with with uh, the safest, most cautious driver in the world, very steady as it goes, very safe. It, it's so it's a not very non-aggressive, and there are a lot of challenges there because will people accept that or not? It's not how I, you know, most people want to drive, um, but will they see the safety benefits of it? And the sensor-based technology um, has the ability to deliver. I sense a pedestrian probably more accurately and consistently, uh, always paying attention than the human driver. The question now is how do you how do you take that one capability and integrate it in with all the other other vehicles doing it, and I'm going to stop because the pe person's there, but the cars behind me don't expect me to act like that. Are they going to hit me? Other things. So lo lots of questions in there, but I, you know, I think for pedestrians, the promise and the opportunity is actually pretty good. Okay, Boodoo's been waiting patiently. Boodoo, please. Um, Boodoo Bhaduri, Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So I have a clarifying question for Mary, and then two other open, naive questions as we committee members are supposed to disclaim, put the disclaimer. So you mentioned that 81% of the counties have some form of public transportation. I would like to know what is included in that public transportation definition, because I'm trying to imagine where I live in Knox County, Tennessee, and as far as I could think, there is, unless you are counting Uber, as part of the public transportation, it's it's very. Um, you want to address that before I ask the other question? Sure, sure. I mean, I I cited the source of that in the slide, um, and I can go back to that. But it doesn't mean the entire county. It means a element in a county. Eighty-one percent of counties have some element, some subdivision covered by public transportation. And if you think about buses, um, it, you know, we're not talking about you know heavy rail everywhere, commuter rail. Um, but it is more pervasive than people realize. Now, it might just be um, on-demand flex route. It might not be what you traditionally think of as public transportation that you would get in, you know, Washington, D.C. or New York City. It could be all on-demand and, you know, small buses, you know, hailed. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, well, well, peer transit. Yeah, peer transit. When you have an urbanized area, you know, within the catchment area, three quarters of a mile, you have to provide transportation. But we use the term on demand when we're talking about all, um, you know, non-route specific, fixed route specific. Uh, yeah, I'll look up that okay. um, yeah. source. Thank you. Um, um, I have two questions. One that you just mentioned that I did not hear anything about rail. 
um, you know, there was once a lot of discussions around uh, platooning of autonomous vehicles. Um, and I quote our chair, Harvey Miller, on Twitter. And Harvey said, those are called trains that where <laughs> you are, you know, platooning <laughs> cars on tracks. So, uh, and, and I think that's a very good point. Um, I, I, I just would like to understand where do we stand because um, every time I try to look up the train fare from DC to New York, it seems like I can fly for less money. Um, the other thing is maybe for Andrew and the rest of you as well is um, um, I, I am pretty impressed with the way the public-private partnership is going, especially the Waze example. So I've been following that. It's, it's very powerful. The question is, when it comes to policy, we have to go to authoritative data sources, like USGS that produces foundational data base maps. You have to go census for population. So how are we going to change this paradigm of falling on privately collected data for informing or changing influencing policy. And the second thing is, what are the cybersecurity measures around these modern technologies? So I was shocked to find out, and Michael, you, you, were, you and I were there at the meeting at Smart Mobility or Summit, that Luc Vassa, who's the uh, executive vice president for engineering, told me at Lyft they have almost no investment on cybersecurity. So what is, where is the assurance? Who is investing in this data quality assurance? Well, it's interesting you said the authoritative data. I mean, by type, by which quote, layer you're talking about, the source of that might vary, right? A lot of agencies will, will readily say they're not the authoritative source of I'm that talking data. about HD mapping, like when you're mapping HD. On, on, the, on the security side, the US two questions. Yeah, not on okay. the security okay. side, just okay. on the data quality assurance side. Yeah, sure. Authoritative data so side. I'll always speak to the, to the first one about, about um, where are the data coming from, right? Like USDOT doesn't authoritatively maintain the the roads, each road, at least local roads, right? Nor the necessarily the source of those road data sets, the aggregate national one. Um, recently, there's also Transportation for the Nation did a, you know, no one knew where all the buses were because they're maintained by the local transit agencies. There was a call for data sharing from those transit agencies to, in, to the um, USDOT to make a national map of, of all the transit um, there, which is amazing, right? So, yeah, exactly. So, so the, the, most, the, the pattern really is the, the, who maintains the infrastructure that then maps it right? It's, it's nominally going to be more local, not national, right? At least take that pattern. So the question is, and what we're seeing is the, I mean, that's where SDIs, they're one of their visions for those were, spatial data infrastructure. Take all the data that's being managed at a local level and quote, aggregate it up dynamically, which is happening. It's just kind of being very ad hoc. And there's a couple number of things going on there um, around data standards. Open data has been a big change in that um, I think there's going to be some more we're going to have um, calls to action from national agencies to local, like the Transportation for the Nation is one example, saying, um, we want your data, here's how to report it, and once you report it, we'll share it back out in a very short turn ter turnaround as a national map so that you know how your transit, transit bus lines connected to your neighbors, right? So I, ideally, it facilitates a collaboration there in a way that's much faster um, than the old, what used to be called um, high field. If anyone's familiar with the high field data set, it's a national 500 some layers, but it was used to be gathered essentially by CDs and DVDs. And they just finally moved to a web services model where the data they can aggregate from local sources and they can publish as a web service. So the goal being if a road is, is built or changes from one way to a two way street, within an hour, the national map is updated to reflect that by, by creating these data aggregation. So that's most likely is, is what I was referring to is that idea of, quote, edge computing, but in a different way where the edge computing is each local city and county maintaining their data, we're reporting it up in the national map, sharing that data back out in a closed loop or an open loop way. I just want to suggest that we're at a 4.15 right now, so we could broaden this to a, to a, to a broader discussion surrounding all three sessions, but just take these people off the spot a little bit unless they enjoy being up there in the hot seat. Hot seat. But um, yes, we can we can broaden discussion right now to talk about all, all three sessions today, the, um, the flooding, the mapping New Arctic, and the um, smart communities. I guess I, I'll speak to the cybersecurity a little bit. Um, 
The D- Department of Energy has uh, has a mandate for the cyber cybersecurity, certainly yeah. the energy system of the country. Um, but it has because of that capability much more broadly. So, uh, for example, we we're just undertaking a broader cybersecurity threat assessment on behalf of both us and the Department of Transportation. We're going to kind of get a readout of that in the coming uh, coming weeks to DOT and DOE leadership. But it, you know, really, that's going to say what are the what's the current threat assessment? Where are there not enough work happening? What are those types of things we should be doing? Um, so, yeah, it's it, you could spend all your time and all your money on it. Um, we, we we are investing in a piece of that, but um, it tends to be more like on things like the electric electric side and uh, less on the, the core, let's say, uh, roadway piece of it. Nobody wants to jump on <laughs> what, what do you want to talk about? What's, what's, what's becoming smart about um, railway systems or how is that evolving to be part of the solutions for the future? Well, I don't know about getting into the details on the technologies, but certainly, you know, as we, we're trying to move to more of a multimodal world where, you know, you've got heavy rail, then you've got now potentially automated vehicles, you know, integration with the private sector. I would say that rail is becoming more and more automated. We've also, we're also looking at automation to make, um, uh, pedestrians safer and also anyone who accesses the system safer. We have a real problem with um, suicides. Public transit is actually very safe. Our biggest problem with fatalities is suicides. So if you go into Hong Kong as an example, you know, their um, heavy rail system shut. You couldn't jump into the into the ongoing train if you wanted to. So we're looking at that also from a safety perspective. So I, I would say there's there's a lot going on right now in so many areas, um, whether it's heavy rail or high-speed rail or hyperloop or transit automation. But how we bring it all together, it's all local decisions, as you well know. And that will dictate, I think, a lot of the um, the progress, if you will. Now, on cybersecurity, just a related note, an area that we're going to be spending a lot of time on is payment integration, multimodal payment integration. And a critical component of that is absolutely security of, you know, personal, personally identifiable information, of course, is very critical. And then, you know, as, as public transit agencies start to connect with the uh, Ubers and Lyfts and other partners, the data sharing component has risen to be one of the top three areas that has to be addressed, and you have to have agreements in place. And some places are having more success than that and, and than others are. But it's, it is an area that we're looking at kind of pervasively. So there's a lot of implications of cybersecurity in the, the new future of a transformed public transportation system. I can, uh, Hyperloop's come up a few times, and it's an, often a point of discussion. We. Uh, we have a report that is it's waiting final clearance at OMB. Uh, congressional required reports will be back to Congress and, of course, made public on two things, the energy implications of Hyperloop and then some uh, level of, of transportation analysis of it. Uh, but the energy implications are pretty huge. I mean, basically, the first Hyperloop systems, as they were envisioned, when we started the report, we basically said these will break the grid um, or you'll have to have a significant physical upgrade to a lot of equipment, like not putting power, but literally the, the the turbines because of the pulsing. Uh, by the time we ended the study, the two major hyperloop companies had told us that they've changed their design because they had realized that this was probably going to be the case. And now they're largely large electric vehicles. Uh, but th- th- from a, um, I would say our, our conclusion is that it is unlikely to be a transformative, massive transportation. It's going to be a very, when you look at where the economics of it makes sense, it will be a limited scope um, for relatively, you know, um, probably a high cost type of service, but where it makes sense for, you know, probably wealthier clients. So we've talked a bit about, uh, quite a bit about uh, the mobility, smart technologies, and geospatial data. I'm wondering about the other side of the coin of mobility, which is location. How do we use all these data, all these technologies in order to plan cities that can be more supportive, supported by uh, public transit and walking and biking forms of active transportation? So how do we how do we connect those two using using these technologies, land use and transportation? I think Columbus, Ohio is a great example right now with our Insight 2050 report. Port, we're uh, 
really, as a city, probably for the first time in a very long time, looking to drive where development it goes. And we are looking right now in our, it's our northwest corridor. We've identified five other corridors where we can drive development and density, uh, serve the area with f frequent public transit, um, primarily bus rapid transit, uh, incorporate smart technology, so connectivity, fiber, uh, et cetera, um, and really drive people to those corridors that can support public transit and start to transform the way we travel in Central Ohio because we, at Central Ohio, have a, we're expecting a million more people by 2050. So I think it behooves the public sector to partner with the private sector in order to create the business case, establish it, and help uh, drive those corridors and make them attra attractive to developers who are really, right now, setting the land use policy for many Midwestern cities like Columbus. I think public-private partnerships and transit-oriented development, we have lots of examples of that all around the country. And that's where you really start to get the land use components along with um, how are you driving economic development, how are you also enhancing mobility, where do we have to fill gaps. And we have example after example after example, and Build America is also doing a lot of investments now in that particular area. So I think there's a lot of really good work and a lot of jurisdictions we can point to that are doing that extremely well. From a research side, one of the things on that large integrated modeling flow I showed um, up on the top left, we've integrated um, urban sim into that and updating it. So Paul Waddell at uh, Berkeley, for those of you who know, Paul um, is one of the, the researchers on that project. And our goal is to be able to have this as something where you can look at long-term urban planning implications in the you know, 10, 20, 40 year time horizon to see what are the urban planning implications as different technologies change. If you had high levels of automation, you know, what happens to people that are further out? Do they cluster more? What are all the, you know, again, that secondary impacts? Um, I just want to comment on a point, and since you guys are sitting up there on the hot seat, of, I guess I'll <laughs> might take advantage of that. One comment that was made earlier uh, that more mobility is better. Uh, I don't know if I necessarily buy it. Uh, we have lots of uh, technology that allows us to move information and interconnect and interrelate in ways that don't require mobility. And um, f how do we – so decoupling energy from transportation is one thing, but decoupling productivity from mobility is another thing that seems to be a valuable thing to be thinking about. It's an, you know, it's a, it can get very philosophical very quick, but um, if you think about like, okay, with new technology, people work from home, it's true. So when you think of, sometimes when people think of mobility, they think very tightly of commuting to work. But uh, even if you have, if you have a growing population um, and, you know, the needs are far outside of work, right? And again, will people, as people have more time, do they then travel to use it for uh, personal efforts, things like that? Also, if I'm at home doing all my work, um, I'm still, am I now getting good ship to the house instead of to offices and there's mobility needs for goods? You know, generally speaking, I think if you have a growing GDP, um, I mean, it is possible you can have a massively decentralization of an economy and therefore you don't have to ship things as long distance, but it, it's hard to imagine it. And as a growing population, um, again, it, it's hard to imagine not having between either both personal and, and some amount of work increased need of, of mobility. So, but it is something I think about too, like could the trends change far enough that you have all these growth of population, growth of GDP, but yet actually physically less movement of goods, less distance. You're going to have more goods and more people, so they have to start moving not as far. We don't have a lot of good examples of that happening over time where they move not as far. I would say right now there's still a lot of people that do not have the mobility that they need, and until we fix that, we need to continue to focus on it. We've done a lot of work on health and transportation, the relationship between health and wellness and access to a mobility resource. So I think that's really critical. I mean, it's like anything else, we're probably going to continue to go down the path of, of not having to travel in certain cases, but then in other cases you're going to also want to travel. I mean, I think about older adults, as they get older, their world contracts because, you know, the, the people that they know start to pass away and then they sit at their home by themselves and that is the absolute worst thing that can happen to a person is being isolated like that. So, you know, I, 
I'm not going to go down to philosophical areas because, you know, I'm speaking on behalf of my agency, but I do think, you know, from, from where we sit, we still have a lot of communities that tell us that people cannot get around. And, and so that's why we're focusing very heavily on enhancing mobility. Yeah, I, I, I think that I think that makes some sense, but I don't think. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, as we've been, as I've been listening, I've been struck between some of the common ground between the discussion of transportation-related issues and the flooding-related issues, and and two of the points that that really strike me is, in large part, we're looking at retrofitting. In both cases, we're retrofitting existing cities for smarter streets and, and safer places and, and different forms of transportation. And then in the, in the flooding issue, we, um, people love living by the water. And so they're, they, these places, the infrastructure, the built infrastructure is already there. And we're having to look at how to, how to retrofit that. So I'm, I'm thinking, as I've been listening to this, I've been thinking about how a lot of the, mapping geographical and applications we've been talking about really apply in both areas as, as ways that we need to, things that we need to employ as we do all these retrofits. The second piece that I've been thinking about in combination with this is just, man, what a cultural change. Um, if you, uh, we, we are, our, our whole society is so much built around the individual automobile that as soon as you try to, I mean, the, those of us who try not to use our automobiles are, are oddballs <laughs> in, in this society. And, um, and we're so built around the automobile. I mean, if you, if you, if the price of gas went way up or became unavailable or, or somehow people couldn't use their auto, there'd be people stranded all over the place in suburbs and who couldn't get to anything they need to be because of the, um, just the, the, the way the location has been, has grown, um, around the automobile. So to me, this is just an enormous challenge that we face in, in, on both counts. Yeah, I, I was I was going to riff a little bit off what, what Dan was saying because I think that by looking at transportation by itself, and I think there are mobility issues for some people. I walk a lot. I had I picked a neighborhood to live in here in the suburbs of D.C. inner inner suburbs, where I can walk to just about everything I need. And as I'm getting older, that's fine with me. I can I can get food. I can get to the doctor, the pharmacy, the bank, the post office, all those kinds of things without getting in my car. That's not to say I don't do it from time to time, but I try really hard not to. Um, I have a almost 12-year-old car that has less than 50,000 miles on it, so <laughs> I don't drive very much. <laughs> um, but I think we're not thinking about some of the, there's some cultural changes that I'm seeing, which people working from home, 20 years ago, nobody worked from home, okay? Very few people did. Now it's kind of a thing that people do. Um, we're not all commuting to work and back. The, the commutes are not from the suburbs into town, they're from one suburb to another. Um, edge cities, the, the kind of satellite cities around the big cities. Um, the patterns of land use are changing. Several cities, big cities, have either abolished or very much changed how they do single-family detached residential zoning. And they've said, oh, you can have those mother-in-law units, and you can do this, and you can put a second unit in. They're changing that whole pattern completely. Um, and more and more elderly people are choosing to live in one of those little mother-in-law units out back of mom's, or out, ba out back of one of the kids' houses or in the neighborhood because it connects them to a community. And I think we, we need to think about the communities we're creating. They're, I think they're very different than they were when I started out in, as a planner and have come up through all of this. I think the geographies have changed radically. And we're not, we're thinking about, well, how can we get more little automated cars out there so we can all ride around in our little pods? We're not thinking about, how do we want to create communities that we can live in today and not segregate the elderly in warehouses and not keep kids out or keep kids in or whatever, but how can we make communities that we really live in and what does that look like for mobility and what does that look like for, for zoning and transportation and planning and all of the geographic technologies that we have to support people working from home but not isolating them. 
Um, so I, I'm trying to think about this in sort of a bigger way than just these kind of, I mean, the pieces are all really important, and I, you know, it's not that we don't think about them, I shouldn't, but I'm, and, I'm having a hard time with... And I would say part of it's not just thinking about the whole system, the whole system. but also thinking about short-term versus long-term decision-making. Yeah. So what are the steps we need to take now to make this transition yeah. to a different type of community, recognizing that for a while it's going to be painful for some people as we retrofit yeah. our cities. Can you explain Jevin's paradox with respect to providing mobility to people? Do you, do you want me to now? Or? <laughs> well, I think, I, think it's, I think it's relevant I, well, relevant to this point that we have people who need mobility. We need to provide people mobility. But when we provide mobility, we create the need for more mobility. Jevons' paradox induced demand, mm -hmm. essentially by cr cre responding to the need for demand, we generate more demand okay. rather than thinking about the system and inverting it and mm -hmm. saying, let's reduce the demand generation. Let me, I, I think Can I comment on one thing oh. I just think if you um if you told people twenty five years ago I'm gonna automate banking, they would have thought, Oh, I'm gonna maybe have go to that teller instead of a human there, there'll be a robot doing that same thing. They would never have been able to thought, think, I'm going to use something called Venmo and be cashless <laughs> and do these other things. And I I would say when we think about mobility Automated cars get a lot of attention, but I think we should think more broadly around automation in mobility, and there's ways you automate that mobility that has nothing to do with automating the cars that exist today. It's maybe a little, uh, little small device that's bringing um, food to someone, that's a small little automated uh, robot device, or things like that. So there's a lot of things that, and some of those things, it, in my mind, could actually be very helpful for that livable community. Um, so. I think Doug Richardson had a question. Doug, please. Do you have a microphone? Let's um, let's get the microphone open. Then. Thanks. Um, yeah, it seems to me that there there are a couple of major uh, challenges. Might not be on, Doug. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah. It seems to me that there are there are two main there are two big challenges, not the only challenges to a lot of what we've been talking about today. Uh, people have alluded to the data quality, data accuracy, and how can you ensure that. Um, I've been in the business of trying to generate, you know, do mapping, uh, real-time interactive GPS, GIS mapping since the <clears throat> so far ago. <laughs> uh, but um, a lot of what, you know, and people toss around the term of authoritative data. Um, Authoritative data right now means uh, so someone who, uh, you know, who got a contract and went out and did the work and uh, had some credentials and so forth. But um, I think that, that really we're going to be looking at really high precision uh, accuracy for, for the, uh, these kinds of, of um, automatic vehicles and so forth with lots of sensors on them. Um, and I think we need to really take an a, a approach that is basically a scientific approach to developing those data sets. We really need to uh, you know, follow any, any other type of uh, data that's collected, except maybe in many cases uh, geospatial data, goes through, uh, we'll look at EPA, for example, if you're, if you're measuring air, air quality. Uh, you have lots of steps. You need to have um, uh, a, a data assurance plan when you start. How are you going to do this, and what are you going to do? And that's got to be agreed to in the contract. And so, when, the, when, the, when these DOD, uh, uh, DOT contracts go out for this sort of thing, you got to really have a, a data assurance plan required. And then you have to have Q, QA, QC checks on a regular basis, and that has to be specified. And then you have to make sure that you're you're calibrating the equipment that's being used. If you do, if you take a scientific approach to the data, you can get really good data that that is really authoritative. It doesn't matter whether you got you know what, which some firm says they can do this and another firm says they can do that and so forth. So I would I would really recommend that we apply science to our data collection, particularly now when when uh, inaccurate data can be lethal in these kinds of situations. Um, the second point I would make, and, and I'm not saying that is, uh, is that there is a yawning gap between um, uh, federal laws and, and um, policies related to uh, data confidentiality and privacy, and what we're going to be, uh, what's going to be available uh, to be accessed uh, with these new systems. 
and I'm not saying it's 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 that we need that it's a good idea or a bad idea that we have these laws and, and uh, regulations in place. But um, uh, I've been on the NGAC National Geospatial Advisory Committee uh, for quite a long time and uh, chairing their um, data um, data uh, privacy and uh, confidentiality committee. Uh, there has to be some fix between that. You know, that we have to figure out what 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 uh, we have to tackle that issue because right now it's it's going to be very hard to meet uh, meet the privacy and confidentiality data uh, requirements of of our of our laws and our regulations. It's just a fact, um, and so I think that a lot of work needs to be done there. And um, you know, and, and there we also have to face the fact that geospatial data is different and it has unique confidentiality requirements or characteristics inherent within it that's your location and and so uh, when you're looking at geospatial data as opposed to most other data that's generated most other data that's generated when you when you visualize it you know you get a, a chart or a histogram or a graph uh, etc when you visualize geospatial data you get a map with features that are generally recognizable to people who know those areas and so forth. So uh, I think we need to look at what are the unique characteristics of geospatial data relative to uh, the confidentiality and uh, privacy um, uh, laws and regulations that we have. I will tell you this, uh, that, that point is Recognized uh, at a, a federal cross-agency level, there's a uh, effort to develop a cross-agency uh, federal policy around automation connectivity that DOE, DOT, DOE, and many other agencies are part of in the White House, and privacy is definitely one of the things we've talked about, and we said it will need to be included in that, that new policy statement. Comment. So um, I want to do follow up on something, Dan. I think you said... Um, so, you know, uh, it's, there is one thing that I, I'm not sure we explicitly talked about or not, which is what is the impact of geography or geographic data on travel in, con in the context of technology, right? So I was um, surprised to hear from the research that Pat Mokhtarian did for the longest time at UC Davis, I think she's now at Georgia Tech. And she showed data and seven reasons out of 10 that how um, the proliferation of internet and communication technologies have skyrocketed travel exponentially. And one of the arguments that she puts forward is um, the availability of the uh, devices and access to geographic data through those devices to platforms such as Google Earth only feeds the curiosity that makes human more mobile. So, and, and we do not settle for um, augmented reality because very few of us you know, open up a browser and look at webcams to experience the beach, <laughs> right? We don't. I don't think anybody in this room does that goes on vacation from the bedroom with a, with a browser. <laughs> and that's essentially what has been driving this travel behavior with a global scale um, of, of the economic growth fueled by this data accessibility that, that that geography has largely influenced. So it has a lot to do with the increased mobility. You're getting to, as a social, I'm Harvey Miller again, or, um, as a social scientist, you're getting to one of the core problems with mobility is that mobility is what we call in, in social science is a collective action dilemma. So mobility is perfectly rational for each individual person to do travel as much as they want, but when everyone does it, it's a collective disaster. And I think that's one of the things that we need to figure out how to connect with all this data is individual decisions to collective outcomes and vice versa. And that's, that's a tough nut to crack at because we're talking about people's self-interest and having 
having to make sacrifices for the greater good in their mobility choices, it's not an easy thing to do. That's my Bill, did you have something you wanted? Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting used to this thing. This is something that your committee does and our committee yeah, does. And so, uh, well, this is a cross. Yeah, sorry. Our panelists are being cut out now. <laughs> well, actually, it's, it's something back to the panel. <laughs> Uh, Bill Selecki, uh, City University of New York. So, um, you know, I, I always, um, in this whole concept of, of smart cities and sort of, um, uh, you know, um, the, the relative role of, of emerging data, you know, I've, you know and, and some of my comments just sort of come from, you know, experiences with the City of New York. And, um, you know, it seems in some ways, you know, I, I guess, uh, over the last, let's say, 10, 15 years as this topic has emerged, particularly the last 10, but even up to 15, or probably in some cases more, you know, the concept, I, I think, is sort of, you know, in some ways become um, complicated, like at the urban scale. A lot of, you know, neighborhoods and communities that I work with, you know, feel that, uh, you know, the smart city technology is um, something done by Google or something done by the city. Uh, they have some capacity. And in some ways, it's sort of a simple simple view. You know, it seems like there's these sort of buckets, at least this is the perception that I'm, I'm hearing, these sort of buckets of, of data that's emerging. I mean, part of it is, you know, stuff that the city does sort of behind the scenes, like, you know, monitors, you know, maybe uh, sewage and water use or the utility looks at sort of uh, peak demand loads. And that, that stuff is very, there's a wall behind that. Um, and then there's, of course, all the Google sort of, you know, urban myths about like, you know, you enter into a building and suddenly you get an ad on Google about that building, you know, these sorts of things that people sort of feel. And then there's also the citizen science stuff, which is, you know, very empowering and, and, the, and, the, and the like. But in some ways, the sense I get is that uh, as it sort of plays out in the everyday lives of and some even city managers, but also residents, that these are sort of three separate buckets. And I guess my question is, one, is that a valid uh, you know, uh, assertion, but all also, are there ways in which, you know, there are ways to get through those membranes um, to have sort of meaningful exchange between these data sets? But in some ways, it sort of speaks to this issue of technology versus sort of the role of, of data in everyday life and social science questions. So I guess it's sort of like, you know, are these three buckets really kind of present? And then are, if so, are there ways of getting through them? I'll give one. One thing that we run into a lot, I'd be curious to get Mandy's perspective here, so I'm not actually in a city and operating in a city, but uh, much of the data that um, we encounter around a lot of these areas of transportation are all in private hands, and it's very, very hard to get your hands on it. It makes research very, very difficult. We spend a lot of our time figuring out how to get good data sets um, out there. Now, there are, you know, so things that are in the public realm, there are some things, but a lot of you know, things of new technologies are based on some level of commercial service, and therefore, you know, and especially in this space right now, because it's changing so rapidly, everyone's very afraid of, is the data that I have my competitive advantage, therefore I don't want to share it or not? We talk to people like uh, Uber and Lyft about that quite a bit, and on one hand, they want to share data to help figure out how to make their systems better and, and not just make more money themselves, but how to make it better in the context of the society they're operating in, but then they're they're worried about sharing. Um, so that that is, I think, a... Um, a huge challenge we're going to have to address. But I'm curious what you found in Columbus as you've been starting to do some of the stuff. Yes, all the data is in private hands. So, <laughs> um, we have been uh, successful in getting access to private data for through our trip planning application uh, that we're building that will ultimately have that common payment system. We basically, as we continue to talk to the shared mobility providers, the TNCs, the scooters, uh, and the micro mobility providers, we came to turn. Uh, we came to an agreement that they were already using using um, OpenStreet's methodology of anonymization. And so we basically adopted what they're accustomed to so that we can have some insights into how um, people move in our community using private transportation. We already have access to our GBFS feed for our Central Ohio Transit Authority, our bike share service. Um, and so we're starting to get a better picture, although very, we've done a very soft launch of Pivot because the common payment portion doesn't come until very late March of 2020. But nonetheless, we're starting to to see some mobility patterns with our users. You can download Pivot on the App Store or Google Play. It's available. Um, so I think as more, more, we didn't know what we didn't know. When the scooters dropped on us last year, we were asking for every piece of data under the sun. All we needed was an API with a service to allow us to put a geofence around it in order to manage the permit. So we, 
we as cities were asking for too much. Um, and I think as more and more uh, people start to understand the private sector and as you work and you really listen to them, they really want to have a, you know, a win-win situation and for it to be beneficial to all of you, all of us. Um, but we ultimately have to understand the business protections and we really have to acknowledge that they're there. And as private sector or as public sector, we don't always want to admit that there are very real uh, proprietary implications for exposing that, that data. Glenn? Yeah, hi, Glenn McDonald from UCLA. So I want to follow up on Doug's comment and then where this discussion is going. And um, this, is, this is in terms of confidentiality of data and the use of data. Uh, EPA has before it the proposition that you would not be able to use confidential medical data and that uh, uh, regulations and policy from EPA would require non-confidentiality of the medical data, which would throw out most of the longitudinal studies which are used for air pollution. And for instance, things like, for instance, the incidence of uh, particulate matters along transportation corridor and pollution like that. I'm wondering where that might go with with this, where we we are striving to keep confidentiality of people's travel patterns and where they live and where they go and all that. And yet there is a move, at least in EPA, to sort of say that data is actually not going to be uh, allowed to be used for EPA to develop new regulations. I can say pretty safely neither Mary or I can comment on EPA in that specific issue. Um, yeah, but, uh, but it, you know, something that it, in a general sense, this is a challenge, right? You, you, Privacy uh, is obviously important. Uh, it's important for individual people, but yet a certain amount of data is in the public good as well. So those are by two very accurate statements. How do you balance them? Yeah, hi, Grady Tool again, uh, 3D Ideas Mapping Sciences uh, Committee. Uh, one thing I didn't expect, uh, it's been such a pleasant surprise, is, is uh, to find the connection between all three of the sessions today. So Harvey, I'm going to zoom out and Carol, I'm going to zoom out here a little bit. Uh, we started our day uh, uh, before you all arrived with a brief conversation about that uh, um, recent paper uh, indicating a, a underestimation of the number of people at risk uh, for uh, flooding um, in, in, in the future uh, as a result of data issues. And I don't know, is Sandra still here? Or did she leave? And then she comes in, boom, the very first presentation quotes the same paper. And uh, so uh, it, it, it dawns on me now, listening to, to you all, that you are making, uh, your agency anyway, uh, are making some fairly significant projections about societal changes uh, uh, based on environmental data uh, and, and assumptions of, of uh, personal, you know, behavior of people, location of people. And so we come back to the, uh, what I think is, is, is a problem we all know in the geographic sciences that, that the data is, is critical. But um, I, I do want to ask you a little bit about whether, um, I mean, the, the level of confidence that you have in these models that you're running. I, I'm I, I took a lot of notes from your very excellent presentation. But I'm not familiar with these models by name, and I'm going to go do a little um, digging in and, and try to get more educated. But, but I, um, I, I just uh, will leave it at you're, you're, you're speaking very authoritatively and, and believing these models, so I hope they're very good. <laughs> yeah, I think the um, right, different levels of accuracy on, on different pieces of it. Some are some are. Uh, some can be directional, and in you know some cases, like you're just trying to understand if you have four technologies all change. Is, is are you moving in what direction, up or down? Right, that would actually be an improvement in many cases. Never mind the absolute. Um, at some, uh, we're at the point where we're actually starting to. We just launched a six million dollar contract with a place called the American Center for Mobility. Uh, we'll run massive automated connected vehicle mobility testing proving grounds to so basically go through and do more physical testing. So we can now calibrate individual pieces of the model to get. It, you know, to understand accuracy or not. Um, I think you, you've got to take all of these things with a grain of salt, um, but simulation does allow you to 
please understand interactions of things and impacts like, wow, when we change this, I didn't think this thing way over here was going to change. Why is that? Well, it's because we assume these things. And then you can ask the question, and our approach to that is to then say, huh, those assumptions are really important. Are they accurate? Do we know them or not? Are they, you know, can we verify that? Maybe we need to do a research project to develop something better on that. So we, we are uh, taking it very much in that mindset of trying to understand interactions and, and multiple effects. And we also do, um, a, we have a whole one-fifth of the program is on behavioral science because it starts with individual behavioral science pieces. And when you look at that, you know, a lot of the things when you do this type of modeling, you're using distributions of people's behavior, distributions of value of time functions. And you, so you're not assuming everyone operates the same way, right? But there's some distribution of things, and that kind of averages things out a little bit and allows you to be a little bit um, – you know, um, you know, more accurate maybe, or not as sensitive to maybe if you're an inaccuracy, let's put it that way. So, but no, yeah, yeah, it, I'm sure it's inaccurate by definition. I mean, right, you have to go into the assumption. The question is, right, is it, but it does it improve your knowledge, right? Yeah. Is it good enough to make some progress? Yeah, yeah. I think we want to start wrapping up pretty soon, but there's a question over here, and then we want to let these four panelists off the hook. <laughs> They've been okay, heroes. Maria Zamankova, National Science Foundation. And at the end of the day, it was a fantastic, fantastic presentation. Woodhoo brought up trains. It occurred to me nobody brought up ships, floods, changing coastline, energy. Are we going to have electric ships? I really don't think so in foreseeable future. Seattle is, Seattle is electrifying their entire ferry system. But, but cross Atlantic or cross Pacific or whatever, and you've made excellent yeah, yeah. presentation on studying, you know, how ships are, uh, how goods are shipped, not how ships are goods. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so I just, you know, kind of wrapping it all together, this was kind of a missing piece for me. We, I will say there is uh, not not talked about, but there is actually quite a bit of work on maritime. We work closely with the maritime agency at DOT uh, and, and DOE, uh, and um, we are actively looking at, uh, there, it, there's a major new rule that's going to take effect in January, and it's, and in my case, it's like a Y2K thing. I don't know what's going to happen when all of a sudden the, all the fuel that ships around the world currently use will no longer be avail, able for them to use. And it, literally, there, and there is not enough fuel in the world to kind of address that at the moment, but... Um, I, so there's a mad scramble looking at LNG, looking at hydrogen for energy sources, electrification for ferries, uh, inland waterway movement. Uh, there's going to be definitely a wider variety of uh, ways you use to propuls uh, for propulsion for freight. And there's also a good amount on this whole mobility area. You think about the data. If I now take all of this type of data, it's, it's just another version of shipments with trucks on road, and I can improve the ability to move that freight across oceans. Uh, then you can, you know, improve the economics of that as well. But there's a good, there's a lot of work going on in air quality around ships in ports, and that ties into the, the the energy source you're using for it. And then how you connect them to the inland waterways is critically important. And the short rail that you use to get them from there to the inland ports, as well as the trucks that move around those ports. So we have a lot of work there to help basically reduce local level NOx, and then it'll have an energy improvement. And also incorporating the flood weather, et cetera, because... We are not currently doing, but yeah. I think we need to wrap up. We're getting close to five. Bill, last last question. Well, actually, it was a, just a point uh, picking up on the Grady's comment. You know, we talked about it also earlier for flooding. I mean, because um, we create this data, and, of course, behind it is a lot of assumptions, and then the question is always bound, like, who interprets it? Yeah you know, the value, the strength, the, the validity of the data, because we talked about the FEMA flood maps, you know, as an early example, like a line on a map suddenly becomes a difference between a whole bunch of things and people look at it and interpret it. So it's really, um, it's the data that we collect and, and create, but then it's the interpretation of that, but that's a challenge. Okay, I think we need to wrap up at this point. First of all, thank you, panelists and keynote speaker, you guys. <laughs> It was a marathon for you. We appreciate your, your indulgence. Thank you very much. Um, we are going to wrap up now with our, um, with our joint workshop. I just want to say I found this to be a very stimulating day across a wide range of topics, and I think we see some um, themes and emerging from, from these different topics. Um, Carol, would you like to add some comments as well? Well, I'd like to say that, that those of us on the committees will definitely be thinking about what questions these presentations and discussions raised for us and how the geographical sciences and mapping sciences might be able to contribute to these.
Absolutely. Okay, so um, don't leave the building or don't go too far because at 5.30, Buddha Baduri is giving the uh, Gilbert White Lecture in room 100, I believe. Is that correct? Just around the corner. Just around the corner, so don't miss it. And uh, thank you very much uh, for participating in this workshop. Um, we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>